and Mr. Hess. Please remain standing for the national anthem. Your Excellency Dr. Irfan Ali, Vice President Dr. Barajag Deo, Chief Executive Officer of HES Cooperation, Mr. John Hess, Honorable Ministers of Government, members of the diplomatic community, permanent secretaries, government functionaries, members of the media, and all our friends, Guyanese at home, abroad, Guyanese at heart, Welcome if you're joining us live, and a good morning. Ghana has been working towards this point for many years. Our president or vice president have been at the forefront. I don't want to say too much. Our first speaker does not require a long introduction. I know I have a habit of doing so, and I will not do that today. But he has been at the forefront and against the fight and on, on every platform. He has said that history must not judge us as having only counted our losses. It must instead herald our efforts to confront one of our planet's greatest threats, climate change. Please stand and help me welcome His Excellency, President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, Dr. Mohammed Irfan Ali. Thank you, thank you very much. Our Prime Minister is not here as yet. Uh, oh, he's arriving. Yes, he was at the function addressing a very important issue this morning, and that is our government commitment to working with people who are differently able and uh, ensuring that our policies and our framework in dealing with that segment of our society uh, is made public. Vice President, Mr. John Hess, members of the cabinet, members of the diplomatic community, members of parliament, members of the private sector. I'm very pleased this morning to be here with you on a very historic day for Guyana, for Hess, and more importantly, for forested country. The importance of the forest and its significance in the fight against climate change has consistently been championed by Guyana, and in particular, has been consistently been championed by our Vice President, Dr. Barry Chante. His work on climate change, the environment, and forests is on par to any around the globe. That is why today's announcement is not only bold and innovative, but again, it is part of Guyana providing and demonstrating leadership on a very critical and important issue, now taking it a step further. Before I go into some extensive brief remarks, uh, I want to 
acknowledge the work of the LCDS unit, which is led from policy framework by the Vice President, and Pradeepa, where is Pradeepa? Pradeepa, please stand. Pradeepa was perhaps the youngest female leading a national delegation from the technical side in the negotiations of COP27. Please put your hands up. And of course, she has been groomed a long time ago by our Vice President in this, in this role. And I want us to acknowledge the work of Hess, his team, the local LCDS team. Put, please put your hands together for them. It's interesting how, of course, yes. And it's interesting to, to see how you guys are acknowledging so willingly without even me telling you what you're acknowledging. Uh, so, um, also I have to recognize a long-standing friend and uh, champion for climate change in the forest, uh, who is not Guyanese, but very much Guyanese, Mr. Kevin Hogan, for his work. I want us also to, because we have not gotten a chance to meet together, to acknowledge the fact that yesterday, Guyana became the first country to be certified under the Art 3 Carbon Credit Framework. This has not happened by accident. It took hard work, long hours, and strong commitment. And as we have said before, our commitment to climate change and to, to work towards environmental issues and protecting the forests as a main tool in addressing climate change is beyond question. And although we are pursuing an aggressive energy platform, our commitment must never can never be questioned because our commitment is always backed by strong action. If there is any where, if there is any area where Guyana has long been recognized as a global leader, it is in our work to safeguard our natural heritage. Perhaps as a people, we do not always realize just how important our part of the Amazon Basin and Guyana Shield is in regulating global temperatures. Providing fresh water, which literally farms across the Western Hemisphere and safeguarding biodiversity. But perhaps the one natural asset that stands out more than the others is Guyana's 18 million hectares of intact forests. We have the second highest percentage of forest cover on earth, with more than 99% of the forests, 89% of the forests remaining intact. The forest stores 19.5 gigatons of carbon. We have a major part of the world fresh water, high levels of biological diversity. Estimates of the value that these ecosystems provide to the world are considerable, ranging from US $40 to, 50, 40 to $54 billion annually. Yet the value has not been recognized in monetary terms. Amazon.com is worth over a trillion dollars. Yet the Amazon forest, left standing, is not valued at all. That is the main reason that tropical forests covering an area the size of Greece are lost every year. It is also the inspiration for the vision for Forest Climate Service, first set out in 2007 by then President and now Vice President Barry Jagdeo which led to the creation of the first LCDS in 2009, the first low-carbon development strategy from a developing country. I want to repeat that. 
the first low carbon development strategy from a developing country. <laughs> developing countries have the capacity to find solutions and present solutions to global problems. 50 years ago, this vision for climate service set out a far-reaching plan to integrate with global markets for carbon, forest carbon, and in so doing, to provide a model for the world. The plan envisaged starting with a bilateral partner who shared Guyana's vision, while at the same time, Guyana could build its capability for monitoring progress on maintenance of the forest. The Guyana-Norway Agreement of 2009 enabled this beginning and led to one of the world's largest bilateral agreements. But the plan also envisaged moving beyond a bilateral partnership to seek integration with voluntary carbon markets. Yesterday, December 1st, 2022, marked a major milestone in the achievement of that vision when the R3 Secretariat issued the world's first jurisdiction scale market ready carbon credit to Guyana. In total, almost 33.5 million credits were issued, one of the biggest issuances of carbon anywhere in the world. The issuance of these high quality credit is a huge credit to many, many people in Guyana. Particular credit is due to the Guyana Forestry Commission, who acted as Guyana's focal point for the Archery's Secretariat in recent times, but who have since 2009 created one of the best forest monitoring, reporting, and verification system in the world. Credit is due to many development partners with others who supported Guyana's effort. And of course, as I said, our Vice President and the LCDS unit. Today, we take another step in the work that we have continuously led on forest and carbon credit. Today, we are signing a historic agreement with Hess, who will buy 2.5 million credits per year. This agreement represents credit between 2016 and 2030 to a value of 750 million United States dollars. It is historic for corporations, the voluntary market, industries, country, and for forested countries. Once again, Guyana has demonstrated that it can be done, and it will be done with hard work, commitment, strategic planning, positioning, and vision. We thank Hess for their part in exercising this great responsibility in being part of the solution as we confront the challenges of climate change and protecting our forests. It is important to note how important good governance and strong leadership is. And I do not say that lightly. As you know, we were not in government between 2015 and 2020. The agreement with Norway was signed between, before that. Our credentials on climate change and the forest was known all across the globe. Unfortunately, we lost that credential because of commitment. Today, we have shown that the opportunity existed even then because in this agreement that we signed today, 12.5 million Credit is what is termed legacy credit. We have been able to go back to 2016 and 2020, the period we were out of government, 
and get legacy credit sold between 2016 and 2016. I wish now to put this into context. As you're aware, in just over two years of assuming office, you've commenced and accomplished much of what we had promised to ensure that our country is positively positioned to deal with oil-rich resource while protecting our traditional sectors and preserving our environmental standing in the world. We believe that there is a balance, and there can be a balance, with strong policies, good vision, and understanding the realities that the globe face. We can find a balance that is just, a balance that is fair, and a balance that meets the development expectation of our people. Guyana has entered a new era. With it, we will face new challenges. This government is focused on ensuring this age of development will bring forth an economy that is in the forefront of energy security, food security, environmental and climate services, ecological services, biological services, and technological services. These are the platforms through which Guyana 2030 and beyond will be built and must be built. Our vision is to position Guyana as a global leader in each of these areas. And in presenting that leadership, we recognize especially for our brothers and sisters in CARICOM that we must work closely to ensure that our prosperity also brings prosperity to the region in which we are fully committed. We are focused on Guyana's transformation for 2030 and beyond, where our economy will be broad-based and built through hydrocarbon revenue earn. This is an important point. The world as we see it today will change drastically in our estimation in 20, from 2030 and beyond. That is why I said recently, we are in a race against time to be on time. Because there is a timeline on everything that we are doing. And we have to ensure that we are aggressively pursuing that timeline, whilst at the same time laying out a framework for economy 2030 and beyond that is globally competitive, that is sustainable, that is resilient, and broad-based to withstand the global shocks that will come. Very important. So a lot of the next eight years will be on spending time in building out this economy. The fruits of the labor will come after this build-up. There will be a lot of fruits, but the main reaping of this labor will be 2030 and beyond. It is just over a year since I launched the national consultation on Diana's latest low carbon development strategy, LCDS 2030. And the LCDS 2030 has been built on this understanding that the transformation of Guyana 2030 and beyond requires action in different areas. From late last year to now, the LCDS Multi-Stakeholder Steering Committee, composing of representatives from our four indigenous NGOs, including TAMOG and APA, women and labor movements, youth influencers, government departments like GGMC, and GFC, and the Ministries of Agriculture and Marine Affairs, engaged thousands of Guyanese in a national consultation process. We went into the communities to listen to the inputs and contributions of villages throughout Guyana. The consultation process proved yet again 
that Guyanese are capable and ready to engage in dialogue and contribute to forging ambitious vision, as well as practical solutions to national and global challenges. The breadth and depth of the consultation, as well as the quality of the discussions, were an example of one Guyana in action. The result, LCDS 2030, a pillar that now sets the scene for the Guyana of 2030 and beyond. Today, I want to highlight a few vital areas, energy security, food security, technological transformation and security, and environmental security. All four are vital to realize the positive and inclusive transformation of Guyana, as all want to see. And in all these areas, the people of Guyana, working together, have the vision and the capability to lead regionally and globally. Guyana is on the threshold of an unprecedented period of economic growth. Few, if any, countries have such an ambitious plan to decouple economic growth from energy-related emissions. Through the investment set out in the LCDS 2030, we can ensure that this growth is powered by affordable and reliable energy. Keeping our domestic energy-related greenhouse gas emissions basically where they are today. Plans are advancing for the installation of more than 500 megawatts of new generation capacity comprising natural gas, hydropower, and solar to ensure adequate energy security in support of our development agenda. These transformative investments will help to lower energy costs, providing the people of Guyana with a reduction in electricity costs of at least 50% by 2025. Some of the work already in progress are the construction of the 300 megawatt gas to energy project at Wales, the construction of a 165 megawatt Miles Falls hydro project, very much on the agenda, solar farms and mini grids to support hinterland communities, for us, equity of access is important. For us, ensuring that no community is left behind is critical for even development, even growth, even opportunity. Because to deliver the cutting edge technology and to transform the human resources of our people, it requires us ensuring every community having access to the same quality of education and health services. For this to happen, we have to invest in energy in every single community, and that is why it is costly. This government believes that all our people must be on the same agenda of development. So whether it is Karau with a population of less than a few thousands, miles and miles away, or is a community in North or Deep South, or in the mountains of Region 8, we are committing to ensure that they have access. And that is why sometimes it's more costly, because delivering that access there is not as delivering access on the coast. So the mini grids are important in us delivering on health and education in these communities. Ensuring that as we committed, <clears throat> ensuring that Guyana has human resources that are trained at cutting edge in their di different fields. Our human resource capacity and skill set must be able to com compete anywhere globally. This is what the revenues from oil and gas will help us to achieve. In the area of food security, we understand that we have an important role in achieving the vision of 25 by 2025 set out by CARICOM, not only in the production process here in Guyana, but also in the production process throughout the region. This requires leadership and working together with our brothers and sisters in the region in removing barriers, sharing technology, sharing resources, 
opening up the system of food production to be freer in every sense. And that is what we are working on. We are already on the way to becoming a major hub for food production. We have set ourselves a very ambitious agenda. That agenda includes being a powerhouse in aquaculture. By just simple adjustment with major investment from the government and a strong vision, we have been able in two years to increase our shrimp production from 10,000 kg per month to 80,000 per month. When we would have completed this project, we will take it to 120,000 kg per month. That is brackish water shrimp, specifically for the diaspora market. We have commenced a number of aquaculture products that will see the doubling of our prawns production. And these projects are led mostly by youth and single women who we have brought into the agricultural system and food production system. <laughs> By the end of next year, we'll be producing almost 75% of all the fresh flowers we need in Guyana, reducing the input that exists. This project is led primarily by youths and single women. We are giving every single Guyanese an opportunity to be part of this growth story and transformation story. Leading on technology and technological services. We are a small society. We are already facing the constraints of a small labor force. As a result of this, our systems must be strengthened. We must now move to a more electronic technological platform to support the requirements and needs for the growth and development of GAN. In doing so, we are advancing work on using technology as a primary enabler in the delivery of education, the delivery of health services, moving on a platform that will see Guyanese having access to the electronic card that will support patient care management information system that will hold key data for every citizen that will be closely integrated with all the institutional framework of our country. Moving ahead with plans to ensure traveling, the mechanism, the platform through which Guyanese can travel is made easier with e-passport. We are not working as if we are catching up. We have made a very conscious decision that we are going to the top of the technology chain and implement from the top of the technology chain. We don't have the luxury of time. Many believe that we have the luxury of time. We do not enjoy that luxury. Because if we work in a straight line fashion, by the time we get to 2030, we'll be in a position where the gap between us and who we have to be competitive against will be for the white. On, energy, on climate change, environmental services, biodiversity services, we're going to continue to champion the markets that exist. We have made a very conscious decision that the Vice President, in the new year, will be leading efforts globally as he did when the world did not even recognize the value of the forest. We'll be leading Guyana's ambition globally to bring awareness, but more importantly, to bring an understanding of the economic wealth and value of our biodiversity our ecological services, our environmental services, and of course, our forests. We have taken a very conscious decision 
that the value, totality of the value of our forests must be monetized. Must be monetized. And of course, we are ready and willing to work with every other partner and to provide our experiences with every other partner in so doing. We are committed to playing our part in this global environment. We are committed in playing our part in climate change, in providing energy security, and we are equally committed in the social and economic transformation of our country and our people. And to do this, we are committed to the oil and gas sector. Ensuring that we optimize the totality of benefit this sector can bring to fuel the transformation that is required for our country. In doing so, we know how important time is. And on that note, I will stop. Thank you very much, and may God bless you. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Mr. President. PES Corporation has been very active in the areas of sustainability and climate. The company has expressed that climate risks can and should be addressed, while at the same time meeting the growth demand for affordable and secure energy that aligns with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Please help me welcome now to deliver remarks. Mr. John Hess. Thank you for that warm welcome and good morning everyone. Your Excellency President Ali, Honorable Vice President Jack Dale, distinguished members of His Excellency's Cabinet, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted and indeed honored to be here with you today uh, again. Uh, today we are announcing a historic agreement that further strengthens our strategic partnership with this great country of Guyana and demonstrates our long-term commitment to the country and its people. Building upon the National Health Care Initiative we announced earlier this year in July, the government of Guyana and Hess have established a carbon credits purchase agreement in which Hess will invest a minimum of US $750 million between 2022 and 2032 to purchase high quality, independently verified red plus carbon credits directly from the government of Guyana. And it is a historic agreement. Today's landmark agreement is the result of President Ali's and Vice President Jack Dale's leadership and long-term vision for sustainable development. Guyana's low carbon development strategy 2030 outlines how the country's abundant natural resources can be used to combat global climate change while building the foundation for a sustainable low carbon economy that His Excellency President Ali just very eloquently described. This agreement will serve to protect the country's vast forests one of the largest carbon sinks in the world, and provide capital to improve the lives of Guyana citizens through investments made by the government as part of its low carbon development strategy. Guyana is one of the most heavily forested countries in the world with more than 18 million hectares of forests that are estimated to store approximately 20 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent trapping more carbon dioxide than the country emits. It's one of the few countries in the world that can do this. We admire the efforts that Guyana has undertaken for years to protect the country's forests and the government's constant emphasis on practical solution and action to combat and address climate change. And a strong focus on providing a global model for other countries, other businesses, other governments, for stopping deforestation and preserving forests. We are pleased to support the country's efforts to advance sustainable development and enhance the quality of life for the people of Guyana. 
Carbon credits provide financial incentives to preserve forests and biodiversity that are at risk due to the growing economic activities and demand for natural resources. And through Guyana's low carbon development strategy, the country has a roadmap for avoiding deforestation and maintaining forests, while at the same time growing its economy fivefold over 10 years and maintaining its net zero commitment. Avoiding global deforestation was one of the major commitments made at the COP26 climate summit. And Guyana was a leader in getting this commitment to occur for many other countries. And that's where more than 130 countries, including Guyana, pledged to end deforestation by 2030, protecting the world's forests and the important role they play as carbon sinks is foundational to the Paris Agreement's aim of limiting the global average temperature rise to well below two degrees Celsius. Between 2015 and 2017, annual gross carbon dioxide emissions resulting from tree cover loss in tropical countries represented between 10 and 16% of global emissions. In other words, if deforestation were a country in 2017, it would have ranked the third highest emitter in the world. I think it's very important to know the role of uh, uh, preventing deforestation that the president talked about and the vice presidents worked so hard on for, for many years. Uh, if deforestation were a country in 2017, it would have ranked the third highest emitter in the world. So protecting our forests and the forests of this great land is very, very important. The carbon credits purchase agreement we are announcing today highlights Guyana's global leadership in avoiding deforestation and underpins Guyana's low carbon development strategy. This agreement adds to our company's ongoing and successful emissions reduction efforts and is an important part of our commitment to achieve net zero and to achieve net zero scope one and scope two greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Many companies, many countries make pledges about net zero. We actually are showing action, the country of Guyana is showing action and steps to make 2050 net zero a reality. The world faces a dual challenge of reaching net zero emissions by 2050, while growing the global energy supply by about 20% over the next 20 years. Governments, businesses, and civil society must work together on cost-effective policies to meet this dual challenge. We all need to realize that nearly 1 billion people in the world today do not have access to electricity. And the president earlier talked about an equitable, fair, and just solution. One for the country of Guyana, but two, one that we as world leaders have to take the responsibility very seriously. We believe climate risk can and should be addressed while at the same time meeting the growing demand for affordable and secure energy which is essential to ensure a just and orderly energy transition that aligns with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Hess Corporation is honored to be investing in Guyana and to have the opportunity to play a key role in helping build Guyana's oil and gas industry. Development of this country's oil and gas resources is important to Guyana, important to our company, and most importantly, important to meet the world's growing needs for energy. With the exceptional project execution by our joint venture partner, ExxonMobil, as our operator uh, of our joint venture, and the strong support from the government of Guyana, the country is already producing more than 360,000 barrels of oil per day of some of the highest value, lowest carbon crude oil in the world with a line of sight to be producing more than 1.2 million barrels of oil per day in 2027. As Guyana's oil production continues to increase, our strategic partnership will help ensure the country's growing wealth is invested in sustainable development and enhanced quality of life for all of Guyana's citizens. Guyana is blessed with so many natural resources. On my first visit to Guyana years ago, I pledged on behalf of our company to work with the government to ensure that the country's oil treasure 
truly becomes the people's treasure. In keeping with that pledge, in July, we announced the National Health Care Initiative and a long-term strategic partnership between the government, Mount Sinai Health System, and our company, dedicated to improving uh, uh, health care for every citizen with access to affordable and high-quality health care. Today, we are proud to announce our partnership with the government of Guyana on this historic carbon credits agreement, which will contribute to improving the quality of life for the people of Guyana for generations to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hess. Prime Minister Pardon me, good morning and welcome. <laughs> Our next speaker is a UN champion of the earth who has long advocated for the recognition of forests as part of the climate solution. I feel I should stop now. Please help me welcome Vice President Barrett Jack. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. President, Mr. Hess. Colleagues of the cabinet, members of the diplomatic corps, ladies and gentlemen. It's with a deep sense of satisfaction that I stand here today to witness this signing ceremony. Um, what is being signed here today, as the president explained, is the first sale agreement of our carbon credit. And um, we're, just to put things in perspective, we're selling 30% of the credits available to Guyana over the period 2016 to 2030 for a minimum of $750 million. So that's a floor. We could um, why, why do we say minimum? Because based on parameters established in the agreement, should there be movement in prices, we will share 60% of the upside in movement of those prices. So we anticipate the market to grow, the value of credit to grow in the future years, and the agreement that we've, we're signing with HEX would allow us to share those upside benefits. So there are still 70% of our credit available to sell to the market after this agreement here today. But before I talk a bit more in detail about that arrangement, um, as the president said, this has been a long journey for us. And that is why I said a deep sense of satisfaction to see how far we have come as a country. I recall the early days when a lot of discussions took place about the role of forests as a potential mitigation solution for climate change. That followed several um, intergovernmental panel on climate change reports which pointed out that deforestation and land degradation was contributing about 20% of greenhouse gases, the point that Mr. Hess made. And the world recognized this. There were many discussions at the United Nations and everywhere else, but I don't think people were ready at that time to place the same emphasis and put the same effort in tackling the 20% of emissions that came from deforestation and land degradation. The same way they were paying attention to um, mitigation efforts from other sources of emission. And so a red plus mechanism was established in the UN, but we recognized that it was not adequate. And until today, although you're absolutely right, Mr. Hess, that last year at COP26, there was a pledge 
to end deforestation by 2030. But it has not been followed up with an adequate financial mechanism to ensure that that happens and that countries that are supplying credit and this service to the world, that they are treated fairly. So our role at the beginning was to point out basic facts that were known to everyone. And so fact one is that 20% of greenhouse gases were coming from deforestation and land degradation. Two, you couldn't achieve two degrees rise above um, pre-industrial climate by 2050 without tackling forests as part of the solution. At that time, there was no concept of net zero. Today, that has evolved to net zero. And we pointed out at that time that only jurisdictional scale models could deliver lasting climate benefits. The world was enamored with, with project-based um, projects that they felt that could deliver and yield results. The multilateral financial institutions were, were going crazy with that sort of thing. And we pointed out that only a jurisdictional scale model could make that difference. Um, we also, so we set about, given that there was no, no um, the, the countries were unprepared to move forward on this, we said, how can Guyana make a difference? And we recognized that very early on, we had to prove this, that this was a sustainable model. I don't want to belabor the point because at other, at other fora we can talk about it. But we got McKinsey and company to come and work with us to do what we consider the technical underpinning for the LCDS that we launched in 2009. And we said that these forests have a value to the people who live in them and the countries that own them. And that value must rec be recognized to the re by the rest of the world. They have one, a climate value, and then a value that provides opportunities for the people in who, live, who live in these countries. So we did some hypotheticals. We said, what if we take Guyana and preserve 10% of our forest that has the highest biodiversity value and deforest 90% over 25 years? What annuity we can yield if we, if we move these or convert the forest into agriculture and cattle rearing and mining, etc. And we came up with a figure. And we said this is what this figure is what it will take to outcompete alternate use for the forest. So armed with that technical study by McKinsey and company, we then said to the international community at that time that was unwilling to look at these, as I said before, jurisdictional scale model. We believe in Guyana, we can prove at the national level, we can create a model that will answer all the questions that were being raised by the NGOs and, and countries at that time surrounding forest carbon. Would it be permanent? Could it be measured? Can you do this without harming indigenous people's rights? Would the money be squandered, or can there be transparency surrounding the use of the money? And bearing those principles in mind, we launched uh, a massive consultation across Guyana, and with hundreds, 300 meetings in communities, every person received a text message about the LCDS because we wanted to prove that it could be have national support. We then set up a national steering committee that involved all the indigenous organizations and every sector in the economy, the miners, people in the forestry sector, women, young people, etc. And that was chaired by the president. I'm telling you with what happened more recently that was in the past. Our current president now chairs similar committee. And 
we got a buy-in from the Amerindian communities. We then develop a robust MRV system to track any change in forest carbon. And we establish a mechanism. I must say that our experience with that has been a really terrible one using the multilateral intermediate funds because our experience in the last 10 years show that many of them are not ready to intermediate climate funds. But these were the components of the model and we said here is a model that answers all of your questions. You can measure the forest carbon, you can um, have indigenous people be involved, you can trace the use of the money. And we established a suite of, um, of investment projects in, on both adaptation and mitigation side to utilize the funds. And so that is how we develop our model. We then, even then, we had not seen much progress on, on financing for forest-related carbon. So we said, how could we then select a partner? We would have to play a long game here. But to prove that this model could work, we had to find a bilateral partner who shared our vision. And then we'll move from there, once we have some experience, into a voluntary market. And then hopefully someday, a compliance market would be developed for forest carbon because even up to today in the UNFCCC negotiations, we don't have a full compliance market for forest carbon. So we played the long game. And that is why the agreement with Norway served us very, very well to start proving the, the model. So it's been a long, a long walk coming over 15 years and that is why we are so pleased that today we're evolving closer to, closer to the compliance market. Um, part of the credit that ARC has now made is we, um, we are now Corsia eligible. And you know that is one of the compliance mar markets for airlines. And so these credits that were issued by, it's a major thing for us. The credits that were issued by ART, they're also Garcia eligible, making them very, very valuable because they're, they're part of a compliance market now. So um, we, before I go off on this to, to the details there, I just wanted to say something the president eloquently pointed out our plans. And um, this whole concept of oil and gas companies and forestry and climate change and the controversy. And we made it clear at the national level that we believe in balancing our approach the development. So even with 10 FPSOs operating offshore, we will still remain carbon negative. Not carbon neutral, not net zero, but carbon negative, even with 10 FPSOs. Secondly, the scale of funding that is required for mitigation efforts and our plan on mitigation is clear. We're hoping from the energy sector to triple install capacity and reduce emissions from that sector by 70%. And then on adaptation, the needs there on both sides are enormous. Enormous, runs into billions of dollars. Our experience with COP and just the recently concluded one is not cause for optimism. That the developed world has failed to meet the pledge that they made in Copenhagen, where they promised $100 billion per annum to assist 
developing countries. The UN Secretary General in 2010, I think it was, put together a group of 12 persons. Um, Larry Summers, uh, Prime Minister Stoltenberg, uh, a number of people. I was part of that group. And we demonstrated how the money could be raised, $100 billion per annum, without shifting the burden to the developing world. Since then, we've had about 80% of this delivered. When we left Copenhagen, the promise was $100 billion in our mind was supposed to be granted. The $80 billion of the 100 has been delivered. The international community says 80% has been delivered. But most of it is in loans not grants. So clearly that commitment is not being met. Recently, the agreement after much fight, which originated in Poland, the concept of loss and damage, which started that meeting that we had in Poland, and was agreed conceptually to be included in the, the UNFCCC process. But there is no pledge of resources there. So the concept has been approved. And, and frankly speaking, I'm not very optimistic. Our GCF and the others, they have received some money, some money, but it is bureaucratic, totally bureaucratic. I shouldn't be knocking organizations here, but that's our reality, our reality. When we got into office, our first thing was to reform the, the environmental sector. Because you had, uh, from 2016 to 2020, we had the loss years where I believe that money from the LCDS was used to create this green state economy that had no real, had no source of financing, was just statements of intent and declarations of ideals. And um, we said we just narrowed the unit down to a few persons. You don't need a lot of people to do this. And we, we have had to remove some of the projects from policy attention that are small sums, sometimes $200,000, a million dollars, but would have the entire bureaucracy of the government be engaged in filling up documents just to access small sums of money. And that has to change. So clearly, the multilateral process will not yield the aid and the resource flows needed to help to adapt to climate change because based on the current concentration of greenhouse gases, we have no choice but to adapt. Already you're going to have um, some forms of catastrophic changes and then given the recent experience where the pledges that were made at Paris, the Paris pledges will not yield 2.5, not 1.5, not 2.5, maybe 3 degrees, which would again be catastrophic for our climate. So we have no choice but to adapt now. And as I said before, the funds are not going to come for countries like ours through the multilateral process. So we have a, I may sound a bit selfish, but countries like Ghana, we have to secure our funding to make, continue to make our contribution to climate change, global climate change ob objectives, but to secure this country, the country that we are elected to, to secure. And the oil and gas sector, Developing the oil and gas sector can allow us to get the revenues to fund the billions of dollars of adaptation needs that we have to meet. And this agreement and the funds here will also uh, allow that to happen. So we don't see any conflicting objective here between, we don't have a big conflict in our hearts about the fossil fuel and the and the climate our climate objectives. We support 
net zero. We support removal, early decarbonization. We support removal of subsidy from fossil fuel production. We support those global objectives. But the world is, and most, it, most of the demand is coming from the developed world for energy. And it clearly can be met by renewable. If the developed world wants us to, to move faster to decarbonize, decarbonize the world, they should tame their ener energy demand. Or, alternately, put more money into renewable energy at scale and to, so that it can meet any incremental need for, for energy. So I just needed to say that um, a bit. Um, as I said before, uh, the Norway Agreement is a great one um, for us. We learned a lot of lessons through it. Until now, we still have some of the funds that we are using. We have 85 million sitting since 2010 in the Inter-American Development Bank. We are now trying to, for the last year and a half, to get our solar project launched to get it going. And we have to go through two sets of processes. We thought we, these are, this is money we earned already. Now we have to go through the IDB process and another set of processes just to access our own money that we want to go to bid for, to put in uh, um, solar farms in Linden and in Escobo and in Barbies. Just that, just to give you one little example. We have paid implementation fees to to some of the international agencies that are, inter are managing these funds to us, sometimes as much as the total of total expenditure, nearly 20% of the money has gone to implementation fees or management fees already in terms of total, total expenditure. So the experience is something that we wanted to avoid. In this case, we are not going to, and I want to speak a bit about that. We are not going to compromise transparency, but we have easier access to the to the funds. So let me just say, um, uh, the, you know that as soon as we got back into office, we started drafting the expanded LCDS. In opposition, we said we'll scrap the low, the green state um, strategy, and we'll we'll in. Um, launch an, an LCDS, but an expanded one, which the president of our country launched on in October 2021. Um, one that covers biodiversity, look at the marine area, look at water management, a whole range of issues, adaptation. And that is, has been in the public domain. We had seven full months of consultation. The president um, gave directions to recreate the, the multi-stakeholders um, council that he chairs, um, body that he chairs. And so and all the indigenous organizations are there. We went uh, to, with, to the National Tushaus Council. We had a buy-in from the National Tushaus Council. There was a vote in parliament on our own low carbon development strategy. So we have scrupulously observed all of the good governance issues concerning public consultations and following all the steps, involvement of people, involvement of the, the National Assembly in the establishment of our low carbon development strategy. At the launch of the, the an expanded LCDS, the president made a commitment, which I'm very proud that we have kept today. He said that no agreement for the sale of credit will be entered until we complete the LCDS process. We had offers from a number of people who came in to, you know, hundreds of offers, literally, and we said no. And um, we, we had to make a, a few decisions. So the first, we, we had to look forward how to 
create a market for our forest carbon. So we reviewed, first of all, the international standards that matched our three fundamental positions. One, as I mentioned before, jurisdiction scale action and not just projects. Two, the need for low deforestation countries to be incentivized because there's still a slew of people out there who believe that um, the high forest, low deforestation group of countries should not benefit from, from financial flows or particularly at the scale at which we are talking. And then, to, so when we did that, we looked at those two and to see which, which standard would allow financing at scale to flow. As we then selected our trees, because it was built around these positions, and it has, we believe it would have high market integrity. And so that is how we chose art. Well, it was a careful decision because we, we knew we had the best quality forest carbon in the world, but we had to have an international certifying standard that had great credibility, integrity, and that was aligned in the objectives that we had, similar, shared similar objectives. So we were very pleased with, with that. We then, in December of 2020, submitted a concept note, and then we were, made a proposal in 2021 to them, and then they've been engaged in audits almost lasting a year, which has now resulted. So it's been two years of a lot of hard work. Um, and, and from a decision made in 2020, when we just resumed, office. It didn't happen just recently, but, we, but that work has been going on. We then ran, we said, we were not going to consider just the office that came to us. So we ran uh, an international request for proposal to purchase our credits some time back, and we had a number of offers. A number of offers, um, and so we, were, we said we'd have to wait until we finalized the strategy and our credit was certified. So we went through a transparent process. So as a result of this, we saw um, the 33.5 million credits for the period 2016 to 2020 being issued now. And going forward, you'd have about, I think, 7.5 million per year over the remaining period. So these, um, let me just give you a, a quick, so the credit for the legacy credit in this agreement, that is the credit from 2016 to 2020, um, has, is paying a minimum of $15 per ton. And so, that works out to, for this period, and, and uh, about $187 million for the credit, 30% of the credit from the legacy period. We hope that in 18 months, all of these resources will come to us. In fact, the payment schedule shows that in 18 months, we'll receive the full $187 million. $28 million of that will go to the Amerindian communities. We made a commitment that 15% of all of the proceeds from any sale of forest carbon will go to Amerindian communities. We had a discussion at the NTC. We agreed that all of the communities, forested and non-forested Amerindian communities will benefit in an equitable manner and they will decide on the distribution. So $28 million of that will go to the, these communities. We're very pl pleased about that. 
Um, and Derek John, I see Derek John, the head of the NTC is here. He was part of our delegation to COP and want to recognize the support that he has given to us um, in this area. If you, and then from the period 2021 to 2025, the agreement, it's $20 per ton. And we anticipate another $250 million there. And then the period 2025 to 2030, it's $25 per ton. And that will be about $312 million for a total of $750 million. But it's only 30% of our total credit for the period. So the Amerindian communities from this deal alone with, with um, Mr. Hassan will benefit from about, a, get about 112 million US dollars. That's a lot of money. We have heard some noise from some people, oh, they didn't do this. And I said one time to one NGO, you show me a country or a per, where you can raise $112 million for the Amerindian community. And, and we will go with your proposal. Of course, we never heard back from them. So you have a lot of people who talk, talk about this. So we hope, um, and this is be at a minimum, because we anticipate now that the market will move. And this is something that um, is crucial for, for us to do. Now, the HES, I want to thank you and the HES cooperation with Ms. HES for, for this agreement. And um, it's, it's clearly transformative and it moves us closer to two objectives that we were working on for 15 years, that is maybe where the world will value more forest carbon, that will move closer to a compliance market. But even now, with this major deal, we hope that the voluntary market, the prices will go up in the voluntary market because the prices were were hovering at some abysmally low levels. And this one major deal would have global resonance and it would make a major shift. So apart from the global resonance, um, it makes Hess Corporation one of the top funders of forest action in the entire world. And we believe that probably the top private sector funder of climate action anywhere and forest anywhere in the world. You're number one on, in terms of private climate action. This is a major, major importance for us. Yeah, so um, so let me. Let me just move on and let's wrap this up uh, before I get too caught up and seeing other things. We are hoping to move this forward. We're going to now go back in the market. We remember we still have 70% of our forest carbon to market. We're hoping to get good prices. We're, we're going to settle, settle a bit and wait until hopefully the market moves. And if the market moves, it has, has to pay more too in the future because we share 60% of the upside. But it's a great deal for our country, for our people. It's a vindication of all that we have worked towards over the years. We see the direction going um, where countries like ours would be able to, if they can get this money at scale, they can outcompete alternate use for the forest, because these forests are living um, areas. There are people living them, they earn from them, all of that. And they, the world needs to provide alternate, alternatives than, rather than lectures and financing. So we hope that some of the pledges now will be mirrored by, by financial support. But thank you, Mr. President, for the leadership that you've shown on this area too. You know, the support 
the push every time and the, the resumption of global leadership on climate related issues that you have demonstrated. Thank you, thank you very much, thank you. Thank you, Honorable Vice President. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we will witness an uh, historic event. We will now witness the signing of the landmark agreement for the purchase by HES Corporation of Guyana's high quality forest carbon credits under the Art Trees Program. Signing on behalf of the government of Guyana is Ms. Sabina Moore. And PS will join us now on stage, Permanent Secretary of the Office of the President, and Mr. John Hess, Chief Executive Officer of Hess Corporation. Thank you all for coming once again. This is for us to the end. Have a wonderful day.